we should start yes sir honorable uh, chairman sir aict professor anil d sir sudhir uh, ms nupur chunjunwala ms rama tandon and mr vivek khare i welcome all of you on this uh, elite uh, panel discussion on uh, dyslexia october has uh, october is a month of uh, awareness for dyslexia and uh, rightly speaking all our uh, eminent speakers of today have come together to contribute in their own way for this cause and their distinction is that they have contributed to this field in a very great manner i'll just run over their uh, uh, bio sketch Professor Anil Sahasrabade is very well known. He has uh, been the chairman of AICT for uh, the last six plus years and has uh, included various accommodations for dyslexics as well as other uh, uh, deficiencies, both in terms of learning deficiencies as well as uh, the young gents yeah, to remove barriers uh, in the field of uh, technical education. Uh, our uh, second panelist uh, would be Ms. Ramat Tandon. who is a certified dyslexia uh, therapist and has been working in the field of, of uh, special needs for over 22 years she has been working with vasan vasan valley school for the last 16 years and also runs her own center called the center of dyslexia in hoskas she is a member of uh, academic language therapist association usa and uh, she is also on the remote learning committee of the organization of noticeability usa and she is their representative in india she regularly conducts workshop workshops all over india and even outside india both for parents as well as for teachers and she has her own youtube channel where she has uploaded more than 80 videos for the help of uh, teachers and parents to understand dyslexia and the tips related to their intervention next we have uh, mr vivek hare uh, who will be talking on the theme looking back my experience with dyslexia mr kare was uh, born a dyslexic and had effectively overcome the disorder with support of the environment he rose to become a successful iit and he graduated from iit kanpur and is currently a renowned angel investor he started his career with fitji where he headed the operations and the sales function with the start of the internet era 1999 he joined nokri.com and held various operations technology sales and management positions he helped launch matrimony and the real estate online classified division of infoedge and pioneered its analytics division this in his last role vivek was executive vp of the corporate development and uh, worked closely with uh, mr sanjeev bichandani in investing in over 11 companies and acquired three of them over a span of 5 years Vivek is an active angel investor and has uh, his stakes in Zomato, Jaipur, happily married, classify Canberra, and Let's Venture in his portfolio. Our uh, third and uh, uh, one of the distinguished uh, speakers today is Ms. Nupur Junjunwala. Her topic for discussion today is why inclusion of people with dyslexia is important for innovation and economic growth. She is having 15 years plus of experience. Uh, in the field of uh, leading multicultural teams which span across diverse geographies ranging from urban north america to northeastern india in both central and state government development agencies as well as in the private sector in the field of policy formulation program planning implementation evaluation and monitoring ms nupur is currently working as the monitoring evaluation and partnerships coordinator at un women With this, I now hand over to hand over the audience to Professor Anil Sahasrabude for uh, giving us his open, opening uh, remarks. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you, Colonel Srinath. Uh, we have with us Sri Vivek Khare, Rama Tandon, and Nupur Junjunwala, who are going to speak on a very important subject dear to all of them and to us. Uh, we have also Dev Devan and Baskar, who have been contributing to. arranging this program in this particular month of october which happens to be a, a month for dyslexics actually this is a very special month and, and nupur came and uh, said that we should organize some programs and we started off with this this is the first of those programs there are going to be a couple of more events in this very month uh, as far as uh, the entire exercise is concerned 
we are always at india concerned about education of the people and then one of the mantras which we have been advocating has been access and equity and when we talk about equity equity is not necessarily only in terms of different types of diversities like you know gender diversity it may be social moorings maybe sc st obc on one side then we have tribals we have rural and urban population we have also uh, uh, people with the divangjans whom we call today you know physically challenged but one of the areas which was not given prominence in all these 75 years was those of the dyslexic children and therefore i used to get couple of mails from some sources here and there stating that our child went to uk and then he is returning will there be an admission possible in some of the indian educational institutions and uh, we were struggling to find out an institution where such a child can get an admission when it comes to i am very proud that vivek uh, finally overcome his uh, whatever that problem was uh, in terms of dyslexia and then went on to iit kanpur to graduate but it's very rarely that we find a child who is dyslexic to find way into higher education sector be it in medical profession or engineering profession or law or many other fields and that's why this was always a pain point which we were always considering but the new national education policy 2020 announced on 29th of july talks about uh, the diversity and inclusiveness in much more detail and that's where we kick started although there were a couple of mails in the last 2 3 years and which i was trying to locate how do we go about uh, the idea came after the announcement of the education policy that we must do something immediately there is no time to be left and uh, one of the motivators is nupur you know nupur has been uh, always after me and uh, she is so passionate about it that i took it up and then we had a committee headed by professor partha pratim chakravarti who is a former director of uh, iit kharagpur computer science professor very renowned professor and many others who were all part of that rama was there nupur herself was there and many others who joined us and uh, there were huge number of meetings and i am very happy that they interacted with parents of dyslexic children they interacted with directly dyslexic children themselves also with several educationists healthcare people you know from medicine nima all of them and came out with an excellent report and i am very thankful that some exhaustive work which has been done thanks to nipur and, and her initiative i was able to do that and as a part of this uh, report we adopted it in the executive committee of the all india council for technical education and we have sent this report to the ministry well very many times we are asked what are that you are doing in terms of implementation of the nep policy the first one is to understand what are the pain points the problems and how do we overcome them and therefore early signs you know detection is very important once you detect in the early age uh, there is certainly a struggle you know it's not an easy cake walk for people with dyslexia but uh, if there is a support system which is created right from Uh, you know parentage at the homes to this initial schooling to the high school to the college i don't think there is any problem in success and therefore there are three s which i wanted to mention early signs detection the struggle which is there and we have to go through the struggle each human being in their life has to go through struggle e- even those who are not dyslexic not physically challenged also go through the struggle the struggle is of a different kind for different types of people and ultimately if we are motivated and we do hard work with passion success is the outcome you know vivek is an excellent example of that and i have many more examples since he's before me i'm just t- taking his name but there are many others uh, in the whole domain uh, we also know from uh, various sources about whether it is newton einstein tesla many huge number of uh, great scientists probably if they were not supported we wouldn't have got those scientific theories and all that so i think in our country we need to promote this in a big way and this is a small beginning uh, we have just sown the seeds and to achieve the success out of this it may take a couple of years time but uh, always a good beginning is always uh, the half the success you know that's what i would like to say and congratulate all of you for coming on ai cities platform for this particular program thank you very much namaskar uh, now we request uh, 
मैं सुनपुर झुंझुन वाला टू टेक ऑन फ्रॉम हियर एंड द एड्रेस ऑन द टॉपिक व्हाई इंक्लूजन ऑफ पीपल विद डिस्लेक्सिया इज इंपॉर्टेंट फॉर इनोवेशन एंड इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ ओवर टू यू मैम थैंक यू थैंक यू अनिल सर यू आर एज ऑलवेज आर अ बिग इंस्पिरेशन um i'm not sure if you all can see my screen really quickly i have a short presentation we are um, we, are, we are able to was, see lupur we are able okay. to see so i'm going to put some faces up on our screen today um and i take i ask the audience to quickly guess who they are and then i'll ask you a question why is why are they up there what what do they have in common so this of course everybody knows is albert einstein he is the nobel laureate as well as the a physicist Thomas Edison from General Electric responsible for creating the light bulb and bringing electricity to our homes Alexander Graham Bell founder of AT&T and the inventor of the telephone um he's the reason we can talk to each other and the beginning of our ability to be online like we are right now Henry Ford he brought he streamlined the the motor the the car which takes us everywhere and here we have Helen Brook she is the founder of pediatric cardiology she was the first person to actually treat hearts of children who were dying of the blue disease um sir richard branson who just recently took us all created the dream for us all of us to go up to space uh steve jobs he's god in technology the founder of apple mr john chambers the ceo of cisco and this is carol greeder she is a nobel laureate and a microbiologist so as you can see everybody on the screen is an innovator is is an inventor is a scientist and of course is dyslexic and this is something that when we look at stigma around dyslexia these are not the people we would think in when we think of dyslexia so what really is it dyslexia is a neurodiverse a neuro uh, diversity a condition just like we are genetically different for gender race ethnicity and ability all of us are mapped differently in the way our brains are wired um no two people are the same and then what we call neuro divergent individuals have a different way of thinking and mapping which may not align to our traditional ways of learning but we are not able to accept these differences in the way we think and call it a dis disability so i prefer to call it a learning difference but through the ages these are people who are different from the norm from being neurotypical so are considered neurodivergent so really what is dyslexia let's try and understand it i'd give you a second to look at this image on the left and try reading it and even if our panelists can read it and tell me how difficult it is or how easy it is for you all this is what a dyslexic mind reads this is the way they these are individuals one in five globally is the estimate um they have to have average or above average intelligence but they struggle with processing spoken or written language when they look at a textbook or they look at text often they see it in the way that the image is they'll see numbers jumping around they'll see inversions and i'm sure rama will talk a little bit more about it so i'm just touching upon it um the key is that they are average or above average intelligence even if they don't perform academically these are extremely intelligent and why we need to find ways of how do we tap to that intelligence so how does one diagnose them there are testing tools um to confirm diagnosis uh, early identification is ab absolutely key and then how do you solve this right so when you wear glasses when you have poor eyesight but are not blind you have glasses like that there are multi sensory learning approaches and ways and technologies to use to help these children walk the path and learn better and uh ideate better perform better so what are they good at so they obviously struggle with spellings they struggle with maybe mental math calculations they probably don't read as fast as uh the normal kid they probably take 3 hours to do something that most people are expected to do in 45 minutes but they have very very strong skills that help them excel in the sciences and innovation so much so that massachusetts institute of technology is known to have more dyslexics in their population and it's often called the mit disease 
uh, Professor Negroponte, who is the brainchild of the one laptop per child and, you know, was heading MIT media lab, uh, MIT labs for very long is dyslexic himself. And it is these trends that we see on the screen problem solving. They look at the big picture so they don't get lost in the details. They think multidimensionally and connect dots that we often will never see patterns. And I think that's one of the reasons why Vivek has been able to invest in most has been the angel investor who is invested in path breaking unicorns of our country. Uh, people otherwise would have dismissed those models as being really bakwas. Um, they're very good at visualizing creatively. They think outside the box and that's why they're often called crazy because the ideas they come up with don't seem viable. I'm sure when Edison thought that, you know, uh, uh, that he'll get light in every household, we just laughed him off saying that it was not, you know, possible. And of course, they're very innovative. The other bit is that we get so stuck onto how we do at young age that we forget that 40% of self-made billionaires globally are dyslexic. And these are just some of the companies that I quote in there. Walt Disney for every Mickey, Winnie the Pooh fan out there or Frozen fan, right? That was, he was the one who brought uh, animation to our doorstep. at and I've already mentioned, Tesla sir mentioned, CNN, 24 hour news, we have bombarded it with it, right? There was a time when Dudarshan came in once a day, 30 minutes and that was the news, right? And then you saw World This Week. But it was Ted Turner, a dyslexic mind who decided that we should be listening to the news 24 hours where he came up with CNN. So it's not just about the scientific mindset, but being ability to bring it to the fruit and bring it to every household successfully. So how many of us are there? Um, there are about 35 million children in India that struggle from dyslexia or some other learning disability. But there is tremendous lack of awareness around it. Strong social stigma. Uh, it's, uh, it's invisible, unlike you know, other physical disabilities. This is not something that people will be able to recognize very quickly. So it's not accepted and then it's further hidden, right? If you talk to anybody, say, oh, my child is normal. There's no problem with him. Wo kabhi -kabhi likhne mein problem hoti hai, but. And then the other side is these children are very, very active with active minds, very talkative. But when you ask them to write in a notebook or do perform in a test, they just don't succeed because their minds don't allow it. So they're accused of being lazy. It's very common to hear, Aise to dimaag pat 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 karti hai, to likhne mein what is your problem? You know, why are you so lazy? Why is the homework not coming? And that's when we start cutting them off, right? They're bullied. They have very, very low self-esteem and they have close to 35% drop out right after school. That's even if they manage to complete because we don't have the environments that are inclusive to do it. So what do we really need to do together? And I'm so proud to say that, you know, Anil sir has been a mentor and so open to this, is that we start building the capacity among parents and educators. How do you do the identification? What are the interventions and accommodations required? And then the emotional support, not just for the student and the child, but also for the family and the educators that support it. It's not easy to work with a child who's super intelligent and is thinking of everything out of the box. And you're trying to sort of tap them and say, please don't ask that question. Let's prepare for the exam tomorrow. I know I have a child at home and it, it's difficult to box her. So, and then what happens? Because there are not enough special educators, the cost of remedial interventions are very high. We land up with these, this community of people who've dropped out. They're unemployed or underemployed. So the Indian perspective, like Anil sir mentioned earlier, uh, the Rights of Persons with Disabilities uh, Act 2016 now accepts and recognizing learning disabilities and inclusion, stresses on inclusion in all aspects, especially in education, where there is now a mandate that people with and without disabilities should be learning together. And our learning system should be adapted accordingly. Uh, the Ministry of Education, CBSE, and the National Testing Agency have come out with accommodations. Uh, there are several guidelines that help these students um, with the help of Anil sir and his leadership, under his leadership, the recommendations of the committee, like he mentioned, have now been accepted and we are 
hopeful that these will soon be implemented within the engineering colleges in our country. The trick is that when you're looking at this perspective, when we try so hard to include, we often start making them stand out and making their condition something special instead of finding a way to make it normal in it. I remember when my daughter was tested, you know, tested for dyslexia, some of the parents that came up to me and said, oh, don't worry, Nukur. We don't have to tell anybody. It's okay. There is a tutor who will help her. But the school community was very different. You know, I had a journey where the teachers have come and told me, Nupur, this is your right for your child. She needs to speak up for herself. And that's what we want for every child in this, in, in the Indian education system. The West does it to a large extent. In India, we've started doing it in schools, but we have a long way to go. So I will end my presentation with one, my favorite quote of Steve Jobs, where he says, Years to the crazy ones, the midfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify them, vilify them. But there's one thing you can't do is ignore them because they are crazy enough to change the world. And that's what we need. We need those people to move us all forward together, to challenge us and to make ways to make our life better. So on that, I, I Hand it over to back to you all. And look forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, now we invite uh, Ms. Rama Tandon to deliver a talk on demystifying yes. dyslexia yes. and interventions. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Share screen. Uh, share screen, correct. Okay. And then? Can I just share this? Yes, please. Madam, it is visible. What you need to do is to make it full screen. That's full screen. Double click, Karma. One minute. Click twice. Just, just open it, Rama. Just open the presentation. Open the file. It's, it'll share automatically. Oh. We can see your screen. Just open it. Yeah, it's okay. No, you'll have to click on that. We can't see it. Yeah, I have on the PPT. Double click. Nick, go to the window. Go to the window which has the PPT open. Double yes. click then. Share. Share is already there, madam. You double click and right. click. Yes. and then go to the window that the presentation opens up. See the wind presentation on your screen. Can you see it? What do you want me to do? Click on the presentation, Rama, which is opened on your screen. Ah, no, no, not. Mama, it was already sharing, but yeah, perfect. The entire screen. Huh? Now double click, it will open. Open that. Uh, can you see my screen? Ah, yes. You can double click or not? I am clicking. I am clicking. I think it is Mama, right now, it's. Yeah, then open with this says uh, PowerPoint and keynote and review. Ah, yes, yes. Can yes. you click on what the. Nee, nee, it's what opened up on your screen, right? The window. You can do a video call, no? Yeah, I have opened it. I have opened it. Uh, maybe uh, wait for a while because the file size is too large, probably. After opening to come to the share screen, it may take sometimes a little longer. Can you uh, call me again?
Mr. Vivek Kare, could we request you to take on in the meanwhile? Yeah, sure, no problem. Having some, having some problem. Uh, Rama, you may you may send the file to us on the email, and we will try to open it and see. Hmm? Mr. Vivek Kare will be talking on the topic. Looking back, my experience with dyslexia. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, um, I have known Upur for quite some time, and uh, it's just we were at her place and we were discussing, and she was telling about this initiative that the NGO that she runs. And uh, I had to share that I had suffered. When I look back today, you know, it, it's my 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 schooling was was very poor. I was a very poor student. And I can break up my schooling into two phases. I was in uh, till eighth. I was in a convent school in a very very small place called Obra, and then I shifted to Lucknow, or uh, to a different school. And my experience in both the schools were very different. And I'm talking about uh, uh, early 80s. So the the awareness about this disease and uh, the the concept of learning disability was just not there. It was supposed to be one size fit all. There was one measure of how i mean you know the whatever the teacher said is the right it was the right thing and their ability to figure out that there are students with different uh, abilities and they have different uh, kind of learning disability that concept was just not there so uh, and like for many of us when that movie tare zami pe came was like the aha moment ke, okay this is something that we have all, always suffered and uh, for me that movie was very close to heart because uh, it suddenly made a lot of sense to what i had gone through uh what i would like to do at this point of time is basically i was very lucky in the sense that uh when i shifted to a new school they were able to maybe not by purpose but just by the way the the whole thing was designed uh they they were able to kind of recognize what i was good at and encourage me and what i would like to share i'm not complaining or i'm not saying that uh, it was wrong it was maybe it it was just that they themselves were completely unaware but as a student and as a child the trauma i faced in that school i just want to share that uh, because you guys are at the policy level and uh, i i just feel that some of my experience may be relevant here so uh, like nupur was saying ki one of the one of the aspect of th this disability is your language uh, i don't remember having problem in reading but when it came to expressing myself writing i was horrible i was very very bad uh, my spellings were all over the place uh, for me uh, you know that a l l a b p d q all of them were same my grammar was horrible which basically meant when when it came to the exam uh especially if it was a written exam the kind of exams you'll have at the end of the uh, uh every year i would do very very poorly but when it came to uh, fill up the blanks when it came to you know uh mcqs i would i was very good i was very good at maths but the school i was in somehow didn't feel that the fact that i was good at maths was something worth celebrating so the two memories which kind of stuck are still stuck and i'm talking about when i was in a uh, uh, sixth class so that would be somewhere around in the year 8081 uh there was uh, there was a new school uh, class teacher which uh, she had come and basically she had given a a kind of fill up the blank kind of thing where every student had to fill a certain fill up the blanks which were like where we were born and things like that and uh, after people had fill up that uh, you know paragraph she was reading out the answers for different students and and you have to imagine i'm talking about 81 i'm now 51 so i'm talking about something which is like <laughs> uh, 40 years ago and i still remember it vividly uh, she said vivek was born in bhopla because uh, i had written my spelling as <laughs> i mean for me al and la were the same thing and i ended up uh, spelling my bhopal as bhopla so the fact that i was born in bhopla is a is a memory i still uh, carry till date 
and uh, another memory that i have is that uh, there was this new science teacher she had joined the a uh, school and she had given a quiz which was basically fill up the blanks and these were like matter of fact things like which is the you know the third planet from the sun and things like that which was like either you knew it or you didn't know it and uh, i had answered all of them uh, she took the copy she gave and i remember she gave 10 out of 10 and she also said very good and you know at that at that at in those classes getting a good from a teacher is something that you really aspire for though those are things that you remember and i was very happy that was the first time that i would have uh, got 10 out of 10 and uh, the girl who used to top the class was my uh, next seat neighbor uh, she saw my copy and she was completely aghast ki how can vivek get 10 out of 10 the guy who normally gets 2 out of 10 and he barely passes how can he get 10 out of 10 and uh, in the next class which was uh, the english class and it so happened the english class was my uh, class she matlab the she used to teach english but was my class teacher so my science copy was given to my english teacher she looked at it and cut out seven answers because the spellings were wrong and she gave me 3 out of 10 and then the world was like normal ki okay now this is what vivek is good at and i still remember that day ki boss i got 10 out of 10 i got very good and then it was uh reassess to being uh 3 out of 10 so i still have those memories and i matlab it has taken me time to kind of get over that and uh, but but i re- still remember i still blame that school i was very poor a student and because it was a very small place what wa- what happened was that most of the teachers were part of our social circle also uh, my father was in uh, upscb he was a engineer and uh, most of the uh, the the teachers and the faculty in that schools were the wives of the uh, uh, in in that project itself so the school kind of carried over everywhere in your social circle also so that stigma that isko aata sab kuch hai lekin ye kuch likh nahi pata hai something that i had always lived for lived with uh, uh, till i was in uh, till the 7th class and in 8th class my father got transferred and we shifted to lucknow and for the first time in a, i was in a different school it was not a convent school it was a school uh, in uh, hl had a, had a uh, had a, had a factory in lucknow and this school was part of that uh, factory i got admitted there and it was a mid session uh, admission there and uh, so obviously i was carrying my books uh, from my previous school to this school and i very vividly still remember the first day i went to my maths class uh, there was the teacher who had one look at my copy and he said ki boss tumhe to maths aati hai and you know i had been in a school which uh, i used to be always far ahead of the class when it came to maths and science i mean if the, if the class was a third chapter i would be in the eighth or the ninth chapter and the teacher would be ki why do you you know why do you have why can't you stay with the class so she always is this complaint why do you have to go stay ahead why can't you stay with the class and for the first time in my life i met a teacher who was celebrating the fact that i knew my maths and he has one less student to worry about and uh, he had a very uh, peculiar way of uh, kind of uh, celebrating your maths that if there is student who used to come with a problem he would say ki jao isse poocho taaki student that he would know are good so that he could distribute his load and uh, so so for me the fact that he was uh, referring his uh, students to me was the first time it gave me confidence ki maybe there is something that i can do well and written is not the only thing which which matters so that is one thing which you know can give gave gave back my half the confidence and another incident which i still remember and you know i actually went all out to find the teacher was uh, in that school there was a debate competition and my name was suggested and i said ki okay i'll participate and i still remember the topic was like fairly you know ki joint families versus uh, nuclear family and i had decided to speak in favor of joint family and uh, i had kind of 
figured out ki these are the points that i want to cover ki the, the advantage of being in a joint family you have more more friends around you you have more supervision you can talk to many people and things i mean the normal the things that the child would say but i had kind of written uh, written those uh, points and uh, i remember in that uh, school for whatever reason the teacher was absent and there was a substitute uh, t- teacher who came and he used to teach economics i was a uh, in science student so he had just come in to fill the class and he said ki boss matlab now that i can't teach you economics what are you guys up to and then it was like you know we have this debate and vivek is participating he said show me your uh, you know what are the points that you are talking and with a dread i gave my notes to him and i was prepared again for you know he would come back and say ki these are the 50 mistakes that you have made the grammar is wrong and things all of that and to his credit he went ahead and read the whole thing and he was very supportive he was like boss these are amazing points these are very good points uh, coming from a you know eighth class student these are really amazing not once did he point out any of my grammar mistakes or spelling mistakes and believe me that school within 6 months changed me as a student for the first time i felt that you know i can compete i can be good at and if i was successful i was able to clear my jai give credit to that school and jai again i mean the thing is ki thanks thankfully it's a it's a, it's a, it's one exam uh which does not test you on your uh britain skill it's about your logic it's about your ability in math and science so i excelled in that i had given j it twice now i had cleared both the times first time also i should have got a good rank but i didn't have the exam temperament so i ended up uh, not doing so well and i i went to it bsu second time without any preparation i didn't prepare at all i was doing i was at bsu doing my first year of mechanical but because i wanted to do physics i just without any preparation came and gave the jai again cleared it again uh, came to id did my uh, msc in physics which i always wanted to so so those are the two things which i want to kind of uh, uh, bring out that uh, every student has a different uh, abilities and it's very important that uh, our assessment should be able to take care of to recognize ki what the student is good at you can't ask a fish to climb a tree and then says you are bad so i mean jai was the right forum for me what was the right exam for me i excelled in that so those are the two things that i want wanted to share and as uh, nupur said and in the hindsight when she said that and maybe <laughs> the fact is uh, uh, when i look back uh, i have been part of uh, three companies uh, three startups when i joined fitji it was a very very it's just test prep company but it was a very small company and we were able to grow that company into uh, you know 100x in terms of revenue in terms of enrollment and everything and i was part of that journey and then again i joined nokri.com which was again a startup and i've seen the you know the value creation and the growth of that company uh, how the organization gets uh, you know w- what it takes to create an organization how to create value for for both the founders for the employees for the investors i've seen that and um, then again with zomato and policy bazaar i was able to do that and now that's what i do on a full time basis i work with lots of startups uh, many of them have done extremely well and uh, it's 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 a great and the thing is at some level i, I uh, what nupur says is true that i have uh, that blink moment i mean i'm sure many of you have read that book uh, where because of my experience i i'm able to like immediately visualize you what would be the journey of this startup where it will get stuck if they are able to do these things then this will be become will become very big and uh, so i'm blessed in that way in a way and uh, and therefore today every vc every founder want me on the cap table and i'm enjoying my life and i'm really grateful to a lot of people uh and at some level obviously i'm very very grateful to the teachers at the hl school who were able to give me back my confidence but at the same time i also feel that maybe what i went through at that first school was also part of my you know that helped me kind of figure out ki what i am good at and leave the things that uh, didn't matter to me at that point of time so uh, no regret no grudge uh, i'm just grateful for the opportunities i got and i was able to convert them and one more thing which i want to say here is that ki uh, for some time i decided to do an mba sorry 
I'll, I'll just take one more incident and then I'll close. Uh, I was, I had, a, I'm a dropout from my MBA. I joined an MBA and I dropped off. And the reason I dropped was, was exactly the, this. Uh, I had, a, it was the first exam that I was giving and they had the microeconomics uh, as a, <laughs> was, was, was a thing. And that was something that I loved. I love economics. And I thought I was very good at that. And they were two friends. We were, we had studied together and you know, uh, when the paper came, it was very DU kind of paper. I mean, I had come from IIT where, you know, you had to do everything and there was no choice. And here you had like, you do eight questions out of 14 and every question had like two choices. So for me, I mean, initially I didn't understand what was this, uh, uh, uh this whole concept, but anyway, uh, every, all those eight questions were numeric questions. And numeric to me is like, hey, boss, if I got the answer, then that's it. So I had given all the answers. I knew all the answers were right. I asked my friend what you have done. He said, I had also attended the same eight questions. And I said, what were answers? He said, these are the answers. But I said, hey, boss, I had taken one sheet to do it. Why did you have to take 11 supplementary sheets to answer those questions? And he was like, hey, boss, you don't understand. Do you, unless you write uh, 18 sheets, you will not get uh, any numbers. I like it boss. He's asking about okay, what's the optimal level of production. How can, you know, if, if I have figured out the right optimal level of production for, for maximum profit, how can that be different? How can, how, why do you have to explain it in 11 pages? But when the uh, answers were given, uh, I had 25% marks. I had failed. And then I was like, boss, ye na ho I left that MBA. I said, boss, I can't do this. If they, if this is the way they're going to judge me, then uh, this is the place not for me. So my, uh, my, uh, my recommendation and my appeal to all the people who are there is that, uh, for dyslexic, I think the most important aspect is the way we assess a student. Uh, please don't ask the fish to climb the tree. Uh, that's my only, uh, only request. Uh, we need to be able to figure out okay, what these guys are good at and encourage them, uh, and, and test them. And believe me, uh, they have their own, uh, strength. And if you're able to encourage them in their strength, those, those students will do extremely well in their life. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It was indeed a very touching, uh, presentation on your part and, uh, really an eye opener as to how you had to overcome challenges to attain this level in life. Now, uh, we request Ms. Rama Tandon to talk on the topic, demystifying dyslexia and interventions. Firstly, I hope you all can hear me and I sincerely apologize for all the confusion that I have created. And I actually was hoping that I wish I had a student here with dyslexia. He would have figured out what I was going, where I was going wrong on my screen. And I'm really missing them. But nevertheless, um, uh, let me begin by saying that I'm really happy to be here. Very excited, actually, to share this platform and to help everybody, I mean, you know, raise awareness on dyslexia. Uh, in 2007, uh, when we had Tare Zameepar, Amir Khan did try to sort of create a, an awareness and it really helped. But when I was working and I had started this program, this course, and I used to tell people that I'm a dyslexia therapist, they would sort of wonder that what, what are you? And they would not understand what am I? And then I used to tell them, listen, I am the one person, the teacher who helps the child in Tare Zameepar. That is my profession. So today, what I want to share is from a different perception. I don't, I, I agree that it's a disability, it's a difficulty, it's a struggle for parents, it's a struggle for children when they are in school. But in the long run, if you see the big picture, after 20 years, 30 years, dyslexia is actually a gift. And there are many talents that a child or an adult with dyslexia has. And as parents, as teachers, as caregivers, as therapists, it's our job to sort of unwrap the gift and hand it over to them. Uh, my slides are not controlled by me and someone else is controlling. So in case it goes here, there, just please uh, bear with me. Uh, what, what is dyslexia? Nupur has already discussed. I'm not going to go in detail. But nevertheless, I would like to say that 
it comes under a larger umbrella of being uh, under spe specific learning disabilities, which is dyslexia, dyscalculia, and dysgraphia. Uh, dyslexia is one of the most common. And uh, as Nupur already mentioned, that there are 35 million people, children in India who go to school who have dyslexia. So let us find out a few other characteristics of dyslexics. Uh, Nupur has shared some slides, so I'm going to sort of skip some of my slides because it's just going to be a repetitive thing. But I, what I really and truly want to share is my stories in my school and last 16, 17 years, how I have dealt with these children and how adults cope up with dyslexia. So dyslexia is derived from a Greek word. It is, this is poor, inadequate, and lexis is word. It's a reading disability. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, dyslexia, dyslexic people are not dumb. It has nothing to do with general intelligence of a person. Although in school, reading is actually like treated as a proxy for intelligence. So if a child can't read, not only the teachers, but sometimes even parents get this feeling that my child is buddhu, usko kuch nahi aata. Because he doesn't know how to read, means usko kuch nahi aata, which is not the case actually. Dyslexia are not dumb. The other thing that is very important that I really want you to share is that dyslexics, uh, you know, like Vivek here, or maybe Nupur, or maybe I, we, anybody of us could be dyslexic. But you can't tell because dyslexia is hidden. And this is what my parents of children who are adopted, they face this issue. And that's a kind of an emotional subject which I will discuss later but I just want to say dyslexia is hidden and parents who have adopted kids sort of are at a loss they don't understand that what what went wrong the child looked okay but suddenly after school started these are the issues that the child is having uh, next one please now Nupur has discussed this that dyslexia is one in five we have uh, in every class of 30 children, you may have about three or five children with dyslexia. It cannot, it's not necessarily that the child will have dyslexia, but it can be also dysgraphia, dyscalculia, dyspraxia, some kind of a learning disability. I want to go in a little detail of the reading activity, activity in the brain of a neurotypical person and someone who's dyslexic. Now, what happens usually, usually, I have highlighted three areas in the brain, that's the left center, where these three areas actually gets activated if anyone reads any material. But in the brain of a child with dyslexia, can you please go to the next slide? The last two at the back, the next slide, it does not get highlighted. It does not get activated. And that is the reason, because there is a difference in the structure of the brain. That is why the child takes more time to read. And sometimes parents are unable to understand this, that he's taking five minutes to read one word or 10 minutes to read two lines. It's just that it's not his fault. It's just there is a difference in the brain structure. There are other things that he may do very well. It's just that reading is a little problem. And of course, there are other areas which I want to discuss a little later where the child or, a, or an adult has a problem. Next one, please. So this is where I've compared the non-impaired reader and the reader with dyslexia. The three areas that are important for reading and in dyslexic brain, the other two areas do not get activated. Next one. Now what happens, research has also shown, if you see the blue circle, uh, can you go to the next, uh, next slide? The blue circle will show some kind of an activation. This happens once we remediate the child, once we have an intervention, once the child goes through a language therapy program, the activation starts. Uh, next slide. And you will see there's a lot of activation in that area. You can see the red spots in the blue circle this happens when the child is provided or you can say treated with the right kind of dyslexia therapy or language therapy. Now, how do we do this therapy? Can you please go to the next slide? 
Next one. Now this is where my job comes in. Now I use the OG program, which is basically where you using A is for auditory, B is for visual, K is for kinesthetic, tactile, motor skills, where I use all the three areas when I'm conducting a therapy session. I'll give you an example. What happens is in a grade one or a grade two, when the class teacher teaches sounds, the sounds are taught, say, for one week. And then maybe after two days, there's a dictation. Maybe after three days, there's some reading. So it happens in sequences. But in a therapy session, I do all the three together. So there'll be sounds, there'll be sky writing, desk writing. I use sandpaper. I use a lot of 3D stuff because dyslexic children only actually understand in 3D. So I use letters, which are wooden letters, and I use um, materials which they can touch. So it's all about seeing, uh, speaking, and touch. We use all the three, and that's why it's called multi-sensory, that you're using more than one senses to teach a child with dyslexia. Next one, please. Now here is my one of my favorite students who I had started teaching in class three. I'm going to read this really quickly. What he's trying to say is, I like to play, I like to read, I like to write, and I like to play with my brother. Now, there's a classic example of reversal. The two is OT, like is LEC, read and write. He cannot write B, so he's written REB instead of RED. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is what he has written as four lines which he had to write about himself. Uh, ferocious, I had helped him. So he's written, Lion is ferocious. Uh, my dad is a banker. My mother is a principal of a school and I like hockey. Now my mother is basically spelled as the way he has sounded off. Mother, mother. Principal, school, I like hockey. This child, after about two to three years of constant therapy, three times a week in school, improved it, I'm in 360 degrees. I want to show you the next slide, please, of the same child. This is his handwriting. I am good in art. I like to read. My mother is a principal. And this is all himself. In fact, he had become so good that uh, when he went to senior school or even when he was in junior, junior school in class five, I used to get complaints. Uh, teachers used to come and pull my leg and they say that, you know, Miss Tandon, what have you taught him? Now he just doesn't pay attention in class and he reads this thick books under the table and he's writing notes to girls. You know, this is what has happened to him after the therapy. And also you'll see that once the child overcomes dyslexia or maybe once he's reading well, the self-esteem, the confidence, the personality goes for a change, a complete change. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I'm not going to read this one because this is another example of another girl who is in 13, who's age 13 and who's trying to write four or five sentences on uh, her hobby. And if you see the way she spelled nature, the way she has spelled uh, her and uh, my, where is my shoes and socks, uh, it's, it's pretty, very poor. But she's still, she's still taking treatment. She's still undergoing therapy. But my request to parents or teachers, when they do find out that there's something wrong, uh, by class one, the child, you know, you have red flags. You should know that, okay, this is a problem and we need to attend to it ASAP, ASAP, as soon as possible. The faster, the better. Now, this is where I would like to talk about the role of parents. What happens is, uh, parents, when they come to me, the first question is, ma'am, he just doesn't read. And then I actually ask them that how many times a week do you read, you know, in front of a child? Do you read every day? Does he see you reading every day? And there are times and I've told them that, you know, it's not important. If, he, if you don't want to read, just pretend to sit with the child with a book. So he sees that, okay, mama is reading, my father is reading, so I must read. And this is how you can cultivate that habit. Basically, children always tend to copy, you know. 
And if you notice, if there is a family of two, say, I mean, there is two boys, two girls, or brother and sister, if the older sibling, whatever the older child will do, the younger one follows. He becomes like a chamcha. Whatever my bhaiya or my didi will do, I will do. So if the elder brother has a habit or you ask him to read every day, slowly the younger brother, younger sibling will follow, will follow into that habit. And this is a classic example. My next slide, please, of what I want to show you, what happens. Now, this is the eldest brother who's hiding, who's hiding in a closet. Now, what happens? What happens to the younger one? Next one. So he is also following his brother's footsteps. He is also hiding. And uh, this is what really happens. Can we go to the next one? Uh, I have written two, three points here where I want to say that uh, parents try to overload their children. When I say overload is, you know, they already study so much in school. They already read in school. They are not good at reading. But... If you start, you know, sending your child for tuitions, for English classes, I mean, it's not going to help because you are probably taking away that time of the child from what he is good at. Suppose he is good at dancing or he's good at drama. I have known of parents, they'll say, nee, dancing, dancing, kya karna hai? Wo class mein time based hoga. I'd rather send him for tuitions or I'd rather send him for some English classes. That's not, that's not the right way to, you know, deal with this situation. Let him invest time on his talents because those are his strengths. And it's better that you spend more time with him instead of sending him out of the house and sort of keeping him out of your way. That's not going to help. What happens in school? They start getting labeled because they are so overloaded with work that they become lazy. They don't want to do their work. And every day goes by and the teachers are complaining. The abuse, what I've written here, is the peer pressure. The children start, you know, fooling around. And you know, kids are quite vindictive and quite nasty if they want to be. They will start teasing that child in school that you don't study, you don't do that. So we should not be overloading the child with all this kind of work, which involves reading especially. Next one, please. Now, these are successful... Uh, uh, personalities which uh, also Nupur shared a few so I'm just going to skip them and here what I really want to bring to everybody's notice is what happens in India I mean whenever I've shown these slides people say that ma'am ye to sare out of India hai to India mein to koi nahi hai India mein hai it's just that people like to hide it they don't want to come up you know come out of the box they don't want to admit that the child has a problem because of course of the society, the peer pressure, log kya kahenge? my in-laws are very upset. I get calls that, ma'am, I want to come to you. I want to come for therapy. But please don't tell my husband. Please don't tell my mother-in-law. I mean, we need to sort of get out of this um, mental block where we are, you know, comfortable with whatever the child has. And believe me, children with dyslexia are very talented. And I'm just going to show you a few slides to show you the talents of these children. Can we skip these slides, please? Next. Next. Yeah, just one minute. Uh, this is a book that I would highly recommend all of us to read, uh, whether they are parents or children. Uh, the dyslexic advantage is actually talks about how to unlock the hidden potential of children with dyslexia. In this book, they have sort of talked about the four strengths. Out of the four strengths, I'm going to just talk about one of them. The four strengths is basically an acronym for M-I-N-D, which is material reasoning, interconnected reasoning, narrative reasoning, and dynamic reasoning. I want to just highlight a little bit about interconnected reasoning. Now, children with dyslexia or adults with dyslexia have this talent of connecting the worst or the best odd things and putting it together. Now, for example, imagine there is a, a lady, you know, standing in the rain, an old lady standing in the rain under a building shed. 
she's waiting for a car because she needs to go somewhere or she's waiting for a cab but she's unable to find one and somewhere else there is a gentleman who's 25 30 years old he's sitting and watching tv he has no jobs he has no no job at all but he has a car so what happened that's how uber came into being someone is using the car and someone is being you know helped with the ride and you charge money for it and this is what happened and i'm going to share another example of my own student uh, next slide please of how they connect things now this is a, a a girl called bhakti she's talked about her dog buddy is a very cute 40 day dog you cannot compare him to a baby when he comes to the kitchen he gets lost because the tile is black as well as he. So she has compared her dog to a tile in the kitchen. I mean, this is just one of the examples. I have lots such examples that I wish I could share with you all, maybe some other time. Uh, next one, please. Now, this is a very good example. This is Mr. Ingvar Kamprad, who is also dyslexic, who is the founder of IKEA. Now, they have their own ways of remembering things. Now, how do you, do you know how did IKEA come into being? The word IKEA is an acronym. I is for his name, initials, I, K. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And E and A are the farm where he grew up and the village where he was from, he belonged to. So, that's how IKEA came into being. Uh, next one. Uh, now, I come to some... Indians, finally. Uh, Mr. Bowman Arani, we all know, is actually dyslexic, has a learning difficulty. I do have a short video. I'm not sure whether they have uploaded it. I had emailed it to them. Uh, if they can show it, it will be great where he talks about his dyslexia. And it's just one minute. Understand numbers, addition, minus, subtraction. And, you know, arithmetic was a big deal for me. It's called dyscalculia. Teachers will nod in, in, in agreement that, you know, they are, we are now aware. But till the American Khan, we did not know what dyscalculia or dyslexia was. Right? Any teacher would like to just, just acknowledge that fact that maybe 10, 15 years ago, dyslexia was not something that people were aware of. If you had dyslexia, people used to use a very crude word, and the crude word was duffer. People used to refer to me as Duffer. Duffer, aapka beta. Just actually say that at my face. And I used to find that what's wrong with these people. There's something wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with me. Now, I did not understand maths and science, but I did understand literature. Uh, even though, even though, and whenever I went onto the stage, I used to somehow be a little more confident. I went to a speech therapist. My mother sent me to a speech therapist. Now, the thing is, you have to, uh, I, I want to tell you a little. Okay, next slide, please. So, if you notice, Bowman, Mr. Irani says that he had a problem with numbers. And this is true. Uh, next slide. When, while he was in a shooting for the movie Dawn, and he had a scene which he talked about. No, 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 previous slide, previous slide. Sorry. Uh, he talked about uh, and gave us an example. Uh, there was a scene where he had to say that, uh, come to our room number 4073 mein jana. Now, because he had dyscalculia, he could not remember the sequence of the numbers. So, he would always say some other number, 4730, 4037. Ultimately, the director had to change the dialogue according to what Bowman Irani was comfortable with those numbers. We all know that children, adults with dyslexia have problems with sequencing. The, some of the other issues that they do have is, uh, you know, they are not able to estimate time, time management. If you tell your child that they have to get ready in one hour, you have to do this, you have to do that. The child is going to forget it. He's not going to manage his time. Uh, adults with dyslexia, because I have friends who are dyslexic, they always get lost on the road. They are not able to understand left and right. Directional, directionality is a problem. Uh, they Sometimes they don't even remember where they have parked their car. So this happens. But this is the way they cope. I mean, they are, there are coping mechanisms to deal with this. And they, they deal it in a very nice way. I mean, we've had uh, Mr. Vivek talk to us about his dyslexia. 
the next one is uh, Dr. Ashok Prasad Janvi. Dr. Janvi, he is the great grandson of the first president of India, Dr. Rajinder Prasad. He is dyslexic himself, but I mean, I want him to, if we can play a short video of him, it's just 30, 12 seconds. And he has four PhDs and he's a visiting faculty in many places, many universities. Everybody, my name is Dr. Ashok Janvi Prasad, a retired professor of psychiatry, medicine and anthropology at different centers in 11 different countries. But uh, more importantly, I also happen to be a dyslexic. My dyslexia had been diagnosed when I was 35. It's only my belief in myself that had me negotiate the difficulties that you normally associate with uh, dyslexia. And I certainly had my share. My take home message to you is never abandon your self confidence and belief. That is what is going to help. Thank you. So, uh, if you see the next slide, I, I've just added information about Dr. Prasad and how he still he lives in uh, uh, Gorakhpur with his family. Uh, he's a professor, he writes very well. I mean, can you go to the next slide, please? The next one. Next one. Yeah, and now finally I come to my favorite student, my favorite Indian who is dyslexic. Uh, and she is now studying in Basin Valley School. Can we go to the next slide, please? She is Nitya and she has written a book, a story book called Purple Flame. She is Mrs. Junjunwala's daughter. She's a perfect example of how timely interventions, support systems, and lots of encouragement can change a child's destiny. And if you ever want to meet her, please, please feel free. She's a charming young girl and she's a ballet dancer. If you can see, that's her picture. Next slide, please. So my take home message to everybody here today is that when you find out that your child or is sort of, there is something wrong at the age of five or six, please start the therapy as soon as possible. And let us all, you know, therapists, teachers, parents, family members, everybody, let us help us, help them to embrace their difficulty, difference, and to teach them the, day, the way they learn, not the way we teach, but we need to teach them the way they learn as it is much harder to renovate a standing house than to build it from the ground up. Thank you so much. And I hope I am able to, and I was able to demystify dyslexia a little bit at least. Thank you very much, ma'am. You've done more than justice to this topic. Uh, Thank you. I'm sure our viewers would have learned a lot from what you have shared with us today. Uh, with uh, all the uh, four panelists having spoken, we now uh, throw open the stage for uh, attendees to ask questions. So I'm sure you would have had a lot of questions in your mind while uh, listening or uh, viewing this talk. We request you to come forth and put forth your questions to the speakers. It's open to all. The viewers can uh, raise their hand and then we'll uh, take on these questions. Or just display the questions. We'll ask okay. the. You know, Srinath, you know, Srinath, most of them have appreciated the session that is being carried out. They are saying it's an eye opener, it's invigorating, all that. That's a good stuff. Uh, we are all recognizing it. But one of the Sorry. questions asked is about, can we consider dyslexic children under the category of reservations? And or, uh, yes. uh, challenge, whichever is there, part of that. I think uh, we will have to check with the ministry notification and then find out, or if not, we will have to judge that. You know, that's not a very easy job actually. And yes, sir. 
uh, the more important thing is how do we support them actually and don't uh, like vivek was saying it is a different uh, you know set of people some school they were denigrating some other school was appreciating i think that is what is most important if we are able to support in terms of encouragement and then lift the spirits you know that's most important rather than you know reservation will come or go whatever it doesn't matter but i don't know really the answer for this so i will not be able to say that but uh, can, I, uh, can i answer to that yeah. question Hi, ah, yeah, Ramaji. Please answer. Uh, a couple of questions. I would like to answer them. Uh, one is uh, uh, the age of dyslexic child. Uh, when the child enters school, say four or five, you get sort of red flags where if you the child cannot say the sounds, the, it's not necessary that the child only reverses and that's why he has dyslexia. No, by class one, if he cannot even write his read his own name, write his own name. if he is uh, very very slow he is not able to rhyme he is not able to say the abcd in a sequence then those are red flags the other question that was asked for the higher education what you need to do ma'am is you have to go to a government hospital and get the certification assessment done that your child has a learning disability take the certificate to your school and the accommodations etc will be done by the respective school cbsc has lot of these accommodations you will have you'll be able to drop the subject so if there are three languages you can drop one language and then higher education class 10 12 you can choose the subjects according to the child's interest so instead of maths you could choose home science and stuff like that and everything is available on the net there's one question how do we help students in higher education if we can come across any well i would suggest that the child gets diagnosed then gives the certificate to the school the school will allow the child to drop certain subjects the school will allow the child to have a scribe which means if the child cannot read or write then there will be a person who will sit with the child uh, during the exams and the person who sits with the child for the exams will be a lower class so if the child is in class 10 that child will assist him will be of class 9 or 8 and uh, he or she will write and read the question paper for the child and the child will just answer and the uh, child also gets extra time madam exactly. rama this is about uh, they are all concerned about higher education professional education and so on so i think whatever is happening in the school education needs to be reflected even in the higher education And, yes, and, yes. And, and that is what this committee, uh, consisting of you know Professor Chakravarti and others, has given its recommendation, and we will be giving it to all the institutions to follow them. And, and, and I would also it. request parents to choose careers for for your child with the subjects that the child is interested in. You know, it may be art, it may be drama, it may be performing arts, any vocational stuff. it's not necessary anything related to academics only i mean of course dr prasad has done four phd's but maybe he is good at other stuff and maybe your child is not so good because you've seen we've shared uh, you know uh, photographs of actors and actresses i've discussed about mr irani it's not easy he's he struggled but finally he's reached where he has to reach because uh, acting was his talent and numbers wasn't so the book that is the dyslexia dyslexic advantage and i also have many other books so please feel free to call me if you all want many other books for dyslexia i will definitely share the names with you all uh ma'am there is one uh, there is one more question which is displayed on the screen ma'am would you like to take it down there are many ways we can detect dyslexics how can we exactly detect dyslexic children is it okay. fmri in the effective way to detect this no there are many tests there is a uh, a lab test but legally and officially you cannot detect you cannot diagnose a child with dyslexia before the age of 6 so you have to wait because there are parents who start wondering in kindergarten and class 1 we can't do that we have to wait and uh, there is woodcock johnson's test and there are other tests available in the government hospitals 
which will tell you clearly the areas of difficulties and disabilities that your child has. And of course, like I've told you, the informal way of testing, you know, at home, you see his books, you see the typical words that he spells differently on every page. The word the will be spelled T-H-E or T-E-H or said and come and those common words which by class one or two the child should know. Question. Okay. Also, uh, another thing is also find out, you know, go through your family history. Since it is genetic, it's hereditary, it is 50%, more than 75%, uh, you know, sure that someone in the family may have a learning disability. It is not necessarily that the parents, but it can be someone, uncle, aunt, bua, chacha, someone or the other may have it. So it is likely that your child will have it too. There is a question from uh, Ms. Shabnam Thakur on uh, YouTube uh, live, ma'am. How easy is it for uh, for uh, detecting a student with this disorder, with this disorder, and how uh, how how difficult is it to be diagnosed? Um, like I said, it's not difficult at all because once you see the books of the child, I mean that's what I do. So suppose the teacher comes to me and tells me that, ma'am, uh, Ms. Tandon, that I think there is something. So can you just check it out? So I'm not just going to straight away go and check out the books of the child, but I do a classroom observation. So for two, three days, I will observe the child because dyslexia is not just academically related. Dyslexia spreads around other areas also. Like, uh, for instance, multiple instructions. At home, you find out if you're giving multiple instructions to your child, okay, Okay, chalo, humko shaam ko kahi jana hai, or we have to go out, go take a shower. But while you're going to the shower, can you please charge my phone? 100% that the child is not going to charge the phone because there are two instructions he's got. He's only going to remember one of them. It happens very often in even class when the teacher is giving two instructions that, okay, get your, open your bag, take out your science book, keep it on the table, go to the library and wait for us. It's not going to happen. He's confused already. So single instructions and go through the books. See if he enjoys reading. Does he really enjoy reading or is it a task? Is he taking more time? Share your problems. Discuss it with the peers, with the mothers, with the teachers. And I feel because I've been working in the school for 16, 17 years, it is extremely important to maintain a beautiful, good relationship with the teachers. And don't tell me, because I've heard this, many parents saying, but ma'am, ghar pe to wo bahut achha kaam karta hai. Pata nahi, ghar, school mein aise problems kiyo aarhi hai. Ghar pe wo achha karega hi karega, because it is one on one. You are sitting with the child. The distractions happens when the child is in a classroom of 30 kids. That is when he cannot understand what is going on, because he's distracted. And remember, with dyslexia, there may be other conditions. We don't know till you assess it. Maybe he has ADHD. We don't know that. So an assessment is very important. In relation to the last part of your answer, ma'am, there's somebody who's asked a question as to how to distinguish between ADHD and dyslexia. Would you like to take it on? Yeah, of course. Uh, it's uh, They are two different, completely different things. A child with dyslexia is not necessarily will have an ADHD or an ADHD child is not necessarily dyslexic. Dyslexia, as I've just mentioned, is all related to reading and other areas where left, right uh, issues and understanding multiple instructions. ADHD is completely different. This is attention, hyperactivity, deficit disorder. It can be where the child is fidgety. Uh, get distracted uh, you know you, you'll see him in the class where people are writing children are writing he will be the one who will be dropping the eraser dropping the pencil managing the bag helping someone he will get distracted with the bird sounds uh, you know near the window so try and avoid to see that your child is not sitting next to the window he's sitting right under the teacher's nose so to say literally speaking so i mean that is attention problem you know not dyslexia but I just want to add this because the child does not uh, may have dyscalculia. So, for example, the teacher is writing something on the board. Now, the child is very, he can't copy very well. That is one of the other things that a child with dysgraphia has. Copying skills, he may miss out words. Now, because he doesn't like to write, he doesn't like to copy. What is a child of 
you know, seven or eight will do. He's definitely not going to be focused on the board. He'll probably be, you know, disturbing his partner or playing with the eraser, playing with the sharpener, telling the teacher, can I go to the toilet? Can I go and have water? He's trying to find a f- ways to escape that work of copying from the board. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, there's one more related question. Uh, one Mr. Nishant Lal has asked, uh, does anxiety disorder trigger dyslexia? No. Okay. Not at all. all right, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much for taking the questions. I, I, I'm going to be personal here. Children with dyslexia are very special. They are very different. So please don't group them with other disabilities at all. They are intelligent. They are smart. Please, we should not be asking them, you know, to fit into any any other kind of disability. They are different. Thank you, ma'am. Any more questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Now I hand you over to uh, uh, Dr. Pradeep Bhaskar for uh, giving the concluding uh, remarks on that. Uh, thank you, Karna Sinaji. Uh, indeed, I opener session. Uh, uh, it was uh, and really a great combination of speakers uh, today we had. Uh, initially, um, uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Nupurji has introduced uh, to the dyslexia, and uh, after that, um, uh, Vivek ji uh, ex- expressed his experience on dyslexia, and uh, well-known therapist uh, Mrs. Rama Madam uh, has. Uh, mention his view on dyslexia. So really a eye-opener session. I am uh, Dr. Pradeep Bhaskar, um, Assistant Director from Policy and Academic Planning Bureau of the ICT, here to express the vote of thanks for today's uh, webinar. Honorable uh, Chairman Sir, IICT, Vice Chairman Sir, Member Secretary, Director of Policy and Academic Planning, and officers of IICT, and my dear colleagues and uh, friends. It seems to be a great honor to propose uh, the vote of thanks to all who have helped us in making this webinar very uh, successful. First of all, I would like to give my hearty vote to vote of thanks to our chairman, uh, Professor An- Anil De Sastrabuddeji, for gracing today's seminar. Thank you, sir, for very thought-provoking and interesting address. I would like to thank to our distinguished speakers, uh, Mrs. Rama Tandanji. Mr. Mrs. Nupur Junjunwala ji and Mr. Vivek Kharaji for delivering excellent talk and uh, excellent presentation and making the webinar a very meaningful and interesting. I would like to express uh, our deep gratitude to Vice Chairman, EICT and Member Secretary for their support and presence in this webinar. Uh, I would also thank our uh, uh, Director Kana Sena ji uh, for his guidance and also my colleague Dev, Dev Devanji uh, for their moral support for this organizing this uh, webinar. I am happy to express a vote of thanks to all the officers of EICT and our staff that has made uh, this webinar a grand success through their motivation and dedication. I would, I would like to give my vote of thanking to the wonderful audience, uh, those who have participated and listen to this webinar very carefully and uh, even putting interaction in the form of question on the in the chat box. Uh, finally, I would like to thank the uh, thank the volunteers and e-government team uh, uh, who ran around doing a lot of things and thank you so much. Once again, I thank all for your cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you once again.